Why don't you open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be doing a series through Philippians. Just to talk to you just for a moment, just to let you know that uh, the elders and I have been talking and back and forth, and in the next few weeks, we'll be communicating a little bit more. We're looking at the search committee, and that's coming to uh, our head in the sense of we're putting it together. And then they will be going through training, the search team. I will be training them. And then, of course, there's some other things that we're doing, and it's going to require all of you to be a part of it, of searching for the pastor. Now, many people try to figure out how long is it going to take and things like this. It could take anywhere from six months to nine months, but I do want to communicate with you all that we're doing. There are a lot of things that we're meeting on and talking about. In fact, the elders and myself and also with the staff, we're planning on going to a couple of advances, as I mentioned before. And uh, now we don't call them retreats. I'm getting tired of Christians retreating, aren't you? <laughs> and so we're, we're going on a retreat and we're going to advance the faith of Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, I just want to mention something. You know, I've been taking a lot of hassle coming from Oregon, you know, because you guys have been complaining. But, and I, I shared this with the guys yesterday in the men's. By the way, that was great. The men's breakfast. You realize you guys got a great, great men's ministry. But anyway, I shared with them yesterday, you know, I hear a lot of complaints. Oregon rains all the time, rains all the time. Look, I was in, I've been in Oregon for four months before I came here after my last uh, job in Yukaipa. And, you know, it didn't rain a lick. Didn't rain a lick. I've been here three weeks, and every evening it rains. And yesterday, I thought I had to get the ark out. I'll tell you what, it was one of those things. I, I, I really don't get it. So I tell you what, you guys get more rain in one hour than we do all year. You know, it's just one of those things. But no, I, hey, I'm enjoying, I am enjoying Kingman. You guys are a great bunch of people. This is a great church. Really are. I want you to turn into your Bibles to Philippians for the next six, 16 weeks. We're going to go through the book of Philippians and turn, we're going to look at verse 1 through 11. And we're going to move very rapidly through the passage this morning. So just buckle your seat belts. But first of all, you need to know what we're going to look at this morning, in particular about the sermon. Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1 up through verse 11. I read it to you. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every rem remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to thank this of all, all of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may prove the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the first fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise to God. Shall we pray? Father God, your word has so much to say to us today. So often... We don't realize that your word is speaking to us every moment of every day and every circumstance. And so I pray, Father God, that our ears will be open and I pray that our hearts and our wills will be willing to follow what you have to have for us this morning. I pray that your spirit will move upon us all. I pray that you will speak through me. And then at the same time, I pray that we as a congregation will apply, make those applications to our lives. So Father God, thank you for who you are. Help us to realize your presence. Help us to realize that we are to feast upon your word. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the things that Philippians has, it's about relationships. Relationships are very important. When you receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, you begin a relationship with God. You begin a journey with God. And that's very, very important. You see, God created us to have a relationship us to have a relationship with him and a relation, us to have a relationship with him. I mean, him with us and us with him. And so we need to recognize relationships are important. And at the same time, does he not only create us for relationships with him, but he's also created us for to having relationship with each other. 
We are a part of the body of Christ. It's important for you to know one another, to be with one another. We need to recognize that God wants you to be a part of the body of Christ, and He wants you to be coming and serving Him day by day. I will tell you, relationships are important. I've learned about relationships. I remember years ago when I was in high school, and I shared this with you about my wife. My wife was in Spanish class. I was in Spanish class. I didn't really get to know her very much. I knew her sister real well, but at the same time, she sat across from me in Spanish. We became acquainted with each other. And for, for the, about the next eight months in, in Spanish class, we began to develop a relationship in the sense of being friends with each other. Well, about eight months later, I went to a play, and I happened to be, she was alone, she was at the same play, and I asked her, I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm not doing anything. I said, you want to sit with me? And she said, sure. And so she and I sat together through the play, and then after the play, I took her out for a Coke. I've been taking her out ever since. So for about four and a half years, she and I went together. We, we got to know one another, then finally we got engaged, and then we got married. And I will tell you, getting married is, I, I thought I knew my wife, but I did not know my wife until after I got married. There are a lot of things about marriage I learned about my wife. There's a lot of things she learned about me. Now, many of you may not believe this. My wife was the outgoing one, and I was much more reserved back in high school. And she, now she looks at me, she says, I didn't know you were going to be like this. And I said, well, I didn't know you were like that either. But I tell you what, we've been together, for, well, let's say 53 years because we went together for four and a half years and we've been married for 49 years. Have, we have 11 children, or not 11 children, I take that back, 11 grandchildren, <laughs> their children, and we have four children, one son and, and, and three daughters. And, you know, we built relationship with our family, and there are a lot of things, and I will tell you there are bumps in life in relationships. There are times we don't like each other. There are times, well, I asked her one time, I said, have you ever considered divorce? And she said, she quoted Billy Graham's wife. No, I've never considered divorce, but I've considered murder many times. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, but I will tell you, that is building relationships. And one of the things that we had to do in that relationship is learn how to love each other. Well, when you come to know Jesus Christ, you are saved from sin. And one of the things God does for you is He puts you in the body of Christ, and you need to learn how to live with each other. It's about relationships. And at the same time, once you receive Jesus Christ, you're going to learn something, that God left you in a dark, sinful world, and yes, He has saved you from sin, yes, you are a child of the King, but you live in a world that has a lot of problems. Pardon the interruption. Just think about it. You have a family, things are going well for you. Everything is just a bowl of cherries. Then everything turned out to be the pits. You lose your job. Your wife becomes unsettled. Your children begin to disrupt the family. And you begin to say, God, what are you doing? I became a believer to be able to have peace, but not this way. Maybe it's not you, but pardon the interruption in your life. Maybe you go to the doctor and you're in physical health. Man, you know everything's great. You look good. You, you walk good. And you go into the doctor. He gives you a physical. You leave the doctor and you say, ah, I passed that physical. Three days later, you get a phone call from the doctor. Would you please come in again? You've got a spot on one of your organs. We need to make more tests. He makes more tests. And he says to you, you've got cancer. And it's very serious. Lord, what are you doing? Pardon the interruption. There are a lot of things in our life, in the Christian life. God takes us through life, and He works with us. He molds us. He builds us up so that we'll be more and more conformed to the image of Christ. But He doesn't take away the problems. In fact, many times He allows the difficulties coming in our life for us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're an athlete, and you're looking to be going to the, uh, some of the D1 schools. Oh, you've had all kinds of schools looking at you. They want you to be the, the top athlete there. They, they have promised you this scholarship, this scholarship, and that scholarship, and they, they're going to do this for you. All these schools, the last game of the season, you get the ball, you're running for a touchdown, and they tackle you, and all of a sudden you hear something pop. You look down, something's wrong with your body. Lord, what are you doing? I've lost all my scholarships. I no longer can be that athlete I don't want it to be for you. You've taken my dream away. 
I want you to consider the Apostle Paul for a moment. He is writing to the Philippians. The Apostle Paul is rather interesting. He, he went around, he started church after church after church. Th hundreds and thousands of souls were being saved. And at the height of it, at the height of what he's doing, God allows him to be arrested. And he's arrested and chained to, uh, chained to soldiers for the next two years. Every day, a different soldier. Lord, what are you doing? I could be out there starting churches. But now you take me at the height of my career and now... I can't do anything but write letters. Amazing, isn't it? Well, we're going to look at this. We're going to work about relationships, and we're going to look how God does something and how He works with the Apostle Paul, how He works with the Philippian ch uh, church, and as he, also how He works with you. I want you to get the context of this, so I'm going to give you the background of the Philippians, and as we move through this, you always... You always need to know the background of a passage of Scripture, a book of Scripture, so you can better understand it. So often what we do is we take a passage out and say, oh, this is for me, but you don't understand the context. So it's, un it's important for you to understand to whom Paul is written, writing to, and also what Paul is saying to them, and then you can be able to gather the principle and be able to apply it to your life. It says Paul and Timothy. Paul is an unlikely apostle. Think about this. When you think about the Apostle Paul, he was a Pharisee. He studied under Gamil, the highest intellectual Jewish scholar of the day. He had his doctorate. He was a man that in the Jewish community, he was high above others. He was born in Tarsus. And what's the thing is about Tarsus, it was a wealthy, wealthy city. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. So intellectually, he was the top of his game. Uh, Money-wise, he was the top of his game. He had it all. People, he was well-respected. And by the way, he was also a Roman citizen. Only 25% of the population of the Roman Empire were citizens. Back then, citizenship meant something. And to be a citizen, you couldn't, um, people, they could not beat you. They could not do certain things. You were able to go to court and defend yourself. So he, he had it all. And then he heard about this radical, this man that came along to claim that he was the Messiah. His name was Jesus. And he says, this is wrong. And so he went about he, killing people. and stoned. In fact, he was there when Stephen was stoned. Paul thought he was doing everything right. But one day on the road to Damascus, he was struck down. And Jesus said, Saul, which is his Jewish name, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in that moment, he didn't know what had happened to him. Pardon the interruption, Paul. But all your life, you've been living the wrong way. And I need to get your attention. When interruptions come to our life, we need to recognize God's usually saying something to us. I happen to believe that God is involved in our lives on a regular basis every day. We just don't recognize it. I also recognize that God whispers to us many, many times, but so often what happens, we get so busy we can't hear that still, small voice talking to us. So He allows things to come into our life. I need to talk to you. So anyway, he went to Ananias and Sapphira, or not Ananias and Sapphira, he went to Ananias, that's another person. He went to Ananias and Ananias shared with him who Jesus Christ was and his life changed. He spent 14 more years on the other side of the desert studying scripture and then he spent another three years with Peter. He spent 17 years after he had already had his doctrine and all these things and going one way and God changed his life and then after that he began to start churches. Amazing, isn't it? There are times in our life we have interruptions, but the Apostle Paul was an unlikely candidate. There's another person that's an unlikely candidate to be in the ministry. His name is Timothy. Timothy was born, I mean, he had a grandmother and his mother, Lois and Eunice. You've read that in Scripture. And the only problem was his father was a Gentile. His father was a Greek. His, apparently his father didn't know the Lord. But his, his mother and grandmother, they accepted the Lord under Paul's ministry. And Paul took him under his wing. But the problem with Timothy is that Timothy was a rather timid Timothy. He was an unlikely leader. In fact, the apostle Paul writes in the book of Timothy, he says, Timothy, let no man despise your youth. Timothy, you need to teach these men how to be mature. He was 38 years old at the time. And Paul had to encourage him to be the man of God that he needed to be. 
And then, of course, he's writing to the people of the city of Philippi. Who, what, what is the city of Philippi? Well, Philip of Macedon, you may not know who he is, but he, is, he was the father of Alexander the Great. He conquered that area, and he built that city up, and it became Philippi. It was a, really a great city at the time. They worshipped many, many gods. Apparently, there were no synagogues there. No Jewish people allowed there, at least, or there were a few Jewish people, but not many. And so, the Apostle Paul comes to the city, and he preaches the gospel. He establishes his church, and now he's writing back to the church, and he's talking to them. He's writing to them now because he's in prison, and he's writing them, thanking them upon the remembrance of them. You see, I want you to understand something that's very, very important. You're going to have interruptions in your life, and you will not know why they're coming in. But you have to understand that God's a big God, and he sees the whole picture. One of the things I want you to understand, and sometimes we don't understand this, is that God is not near as concerned about your profession. He's not near concerned about where you are geographically, but he is concerned who you are as a person and the, your walk with him. And we're going to look at that in a few moments. But before we do, let's look at the major themes of the book of the Bible here, of this especially Philipp, uh, Philippians. First of all, he says, give thanks. Thanks. What does that mean? He's saying, I, I am thankful upon remembrance of you. And one of the things the Apostle Paul says, in all things give thanks in other portions of Scripture. In Romans, he says, you know, they did not know God, as, or they did not honor God as God, nor were they thankful. The Apostle Paul said, in all things give thanks. Part of the problem with us as Christians, we don't recognize what God has done in our lives. Jesus Christ came into the world and he died for our sins so that you and I could have eternal life. Yes, we live in a dark, sinful world, but one day we are going to be in heaven with Him. We are children of God. We are special people, and we need to learn to be thankful. And when a person is not thankful, they become bitter, and they begin to not hear the voice of God, and they begin to stray away from the Lord. So when you're going through difficulty, you need to learn to be thankful. Another thing he talks about is joy. We find that in the fruits of the Spirit, it talks about love, joy. Joy is one of those things. You know, in the, in, uh, in, in the Declaration of Independence, we're to pursue happiness. However, you cannot have joy. The only people that can have joy are Christians. I really believe this. This is Garyology. You may not buy it. That's okay. But joy is one of those things that's intrinsic. When the world around you is in a mess, and when there are storms of life around you, we have joy of knowing that God is in control. It is a peace that God gives us, joy. Another thing this book talks about is partnership. Do you realize this church can never become a great church until you and I recognize that each and every one of us have spiritual gifts? And do you realize that we are the children of God? And do you realize we've been called into the bride of Christ? And do you realize that you have been called to be in a local church and you're not to forsake the assembling together? Do you realize that we are together in this church together is to reach kingdom for Christ? Some people have this idea. Well, I, you know, I mean, I go worship God when I'm out, you know, in the forest. I don't need other Christians. That's a lie from the devil. You can never grow in Christ without God's people. We need to be accountable to each other spiritually. Ministry is a partnership. Remember, God has called us as a body. He has called us as a family to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Another thing that he deals with is partnership or servant, I mean, not partnership, but servanthood. Servanthood, what does it mean? Jesus said, I have come into the world not to be worshipped, but to seek and to save that which is lost. Chuck Swindoll has written a book on being a servant, and it's an excellent, excellent book. One of the things you need to understand, you and I are all called to be ministers, but we are to serve one another. Too often people come to church, they listen to sermons, and they say, wow, I really enjoyed the sermon, sermon, but they don't serve other people. We need to learn to find our spiritual gifting, and we need to serve one another. The Apostle Paul addresses of being a servant. Think about it. Jesus Christ himself in Philippians 2, he did not hang on to his godhood, but he willingly became a man to go to the cross for us. And that's God Almighty, the one who holds all things together. And if we can't be a servant like Jesus, then we need to have an attitude check. He's called us to being a servant. 
The next thing we looked at in being servanthood is in, and one of the major themes is being a victorious Christian living. I want to tell you something. I'm on the winning side. I love to win. And with Jesus, I win. I'm going to heaven. I'm adopted in the family of God, aren't you? You know, some, sometimes we as Christians, we think, oh, you know, we, you know, people don't like me. But Jesus loves me. God loves me. And I got a family of believers that love me, some of them. <laughs> All I'm telling you is, is that, you know, God is great this way. We need to recognize that God is giving us victory. Look, Jesus is a winner. He went to the cross to do what? To save souls. Lost souls, and we were all lost at one time. Then finally, the major theme in this scripture here in the Philippians is Christ, our goal. Jesus is our goal. We need to learn to have a relationship with Jesus. This journey that we're on is all about Jesus and our walk with Him. Do you think about Jesus anymore? Is Jesus the center of your life? I hope so. Now, let's move on as we begin to say, so we need to have a reminder of who we are. He says, I thank my God upon remembrance of you in prayer. You know, the Apostle Paul, he goes back and he's remembering, and he's remembering that he was, you know, he was headed east, the Bible tells us. He was going to go to India and then to China to present the gospel. And, and so he went to bed one night, and there was a man crying over in Macedon, over in the Philippi area, that whole area. And they said, come over here and preach the, uh, preach the gospel. And so the apostle Paul, instead of going east, he went west. And by the way, by him going west, Europe became Christian because of the apostle Paul's preaching. Do you realize what that meant? That means you and I became believers because Christianity spread west first. That's an amazing fact. Think about that for a moment. Paul gets there. He meets Lydia. He sees Lydia, and he, who is Lydia? Well, Lydia is a seller of purple. She was Asiatic. She was a businesswoman. He sees her by the river or by the creek there, and he goes down to her, and he shares Christ. She becomes a believer. And then he begins to preach the gospel in Philippi, and there was this demented girl going around, and she was interrupting every time he preached, and he cast the demon out of her. And then what happened, there was a jailer, he, they were, he and Barnabas were, you know, tied up and everything, and they begin to sing praises to God, this is, you can read this in Acts 16, and, and they're singing hymns, and all of a sudden an earthquake comes, and finally the jailer runs in and says, Saul, he says, what can I do to be saved? He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure he wasn't thinking about that. I'm sure he was thinking about that his life was going to be taken, but Paul looked at him in his very heart, and he says, eternity is more important, you need to know Jesus. That night... The jailer took him out, and he said, and Paul said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It changed his life. Those three people started the Philippian, j or, or Philippian church, not jail, but ch church. God always takes the unlikely to do the impossible. These people, you know, Lydia, seller of purple, a woman starting a church, a jailer, a demented woman, But yet that church grew. And do you realize that the Apostle Paul invested his life in that church at Philippi? And now Paul's imprisoned and Epaphroditus comes and helps them. And do you realize when Paul traveled around after he left that church, they supported him? In fact, they were the only church that was giving him financial support. I'm going to tell you something. When you invest your life into people, it has its returns. He invested his life into people. You know, I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor starting out, I was volunteering, going to seminary and working a job, and, and I, there was a man there, he was a manager of Safeway, or not Safeway, but uh, J.C. Penney's. His name was Stan. I worked with his kids, and later on I went to another church, and he happened to be there again. And this was years later, and I was the youth pastor there, and I worked with his children once again when they were in high school, and I was able to direct them to a Christian school. Years later... When I was working on my doctorate, Stan calls me. He says, let me pay for all your doctorate. He wanted to invest in me. Another friend, and, and by the way, he not only paid for my doctorate, he also paid for my son's seminary. Why? Because I had invested my life into his kids about Jesus Christ. 
See, Paul understood that. He invested his life into the Philippian people, telling them about Jesus, and later on, they help him in the ministry. You never know what's going to happen to you when you share Christ with somebody. Many, many years, it will come back. Paul was ongo- he had an ongoing devotion to them. He loved them. He continued in prayer for them. And as we move to the third point, it says, remember of what God does. You know, he who has begun a good work in you will continue it to the day of salvation. Or, or not salvation, until the day of, uh, well, not salvation, day of, uh, I'm losing my place today. I don't know why. He who has begun a good work in you will continue until the day of Christ Jesus. The day of Christ Jesus. Think about that. The day that Jesus took you from darkness to light, from sin to righteousness, from unforgiveness to forgiveness, for being a child of the devil to being a son of God, a children of God, God began a good work in you. He gave you His Word, the Bible, to live by, and He gave you the Holy Spirit to live in you, to live the life. And you need to understand that, you know, it's kind of like a baby being born in the world. When a baby's born in the world, they poop their britches. They cry at night. Now, I love babies. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. But there's nothing worse than having a 25-year-old still acting like a baby. <laughs> or a 40-year-old. Or a 70-year-old. You see, when you got saved, God began to work in your life and He began to chip away. He began a good work in you. And you are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He saved you from sin. Why? Because He wanted you to be able to walk in righteousness, to walk in holiness. When you got saved, all of your sins were forgiven. All of them. Past, present, and future. You're no longer a child of darkness. You're a child of light. You're a child of God. Another thing that he did is when he saved you, he saved you for good works. You see, most people think, oh, now that I'm saved, I don't have to worry about it. No, 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 no. He left you here on earth. Do you realize, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, he has confidence in you. He has faith in you. That he's going to work in you. Now, your job is to minister to people in a dark world. You are to minister to other Christians and also people who are not Christians. God has called you to do good works. Ephesians 2 says, you are saved by grace. You can't earn salvation, but you have been saved unto good works, to do good works. We miss that. Do you know there is another thing that you find out in this passage as you're looking at it? He sanctifies us. What does that mean? Continue until the day of Christ Jesus, until we are complete. Sanctification means, basically, you have been set apart for a purpose. That purpose is holiness. Well, you say, well, I'm not holy. I'm just, you know, I'm just saved by grace. Wait a minute. He saved you to grow up in faith and to represent Jesus Christ. You are holy positionally. And you're to grow in holiness. You're to grow in godliness. You're to grow up and be like Jesus. Wow. That boggles my mind. It really does. To grow up to be like Jesus. Why? Because the world needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ. People have all kinds of religion in the world, and they're looking for hope, and they can't find it. You know what the difference between Christianity and Buddhism, Mormonism, Hinduism, you know what the difference is? Grace and redemption. Think about that for a moment. Islam doesn't offer it. You have to work for it. All the other religions, you have to work for salvation. But God in His graciousness saves us by His grace, and then we live in grace. And not only that, He gives us His Spirit to work in us and through us, and we become conformed to the image of Christ. That's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions. It is that God in the flesh came, died for our sins, and rose again. None of the other religions can even compare. We need to understand the great salvation we have in Jesus Christ. You know, as I look at this, I am a work in progress. Aren't you? I'm 71 years old. I've got a lot of faults. I really do. I'm still working at it. Or I should say God's still working at it, not me. And I still have pardoned the interruptions. I still have times in my life that God sometimes spanks me hard. Sometimes He kicks me hard, but I need it. 
And sometimes he's very gentle with me. There are times when I'm hurting so badly and I don't have any other voice to hear but his. And in his comfort, he comes and gives it to me. Isn't that true of you? You see, God has saved us to do a great work. And you know, I'm told in Colossians that the work is going to be complete in Jesus. Think about this. One day when we go to heaven, all the tears and everything will be wiped away and we will see Jesus and we are complete in Him. Positionally, we're complete in Him, but we're going to be made perfect when we receive our new bodies. Oh, people, we're a work in progress. God's not done with you. He will not be done with you until the final day. Finally, Paul says, I'm praying for you. And there are seven things I want us to look at very briefly in prayer and move through it rather rapidly. I know I'm moving rapidly today because I have a lot. He says, I am praying for you, first of all, for love. You know, the one area that is different or should be different in every church in America that knows Jesus is that we are a loving congregation. Have you ever gone into a church or ever, well, even, have you ever gone into a room and you felt tension? You didn't know what was going on. You said, oh, good night. Have you ever gone to a church business meeting? I'll tell you this, whenever you have three Baptists, you have two denominations. So I understand that. So in other words, they don't get along very well sometimes. But I, I want you to understand is that sometimes you don't feel love, do you? But you know that you have the Holy Spirit in you. And if you're not loving and forgiving, and if you're not accepting people and helping them and teaching them about who Jesus is, then you better examine yourself. It's important. And he says, I pray that the church will have love. Francis Schaeffer said, the mark of a Christian is love. The Bible says the same thing. He was quoting it. The second thing he says, my prayer for you is that you have knowledge. Knowledge of who? Knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3.10, it says, that I may know Him, who? Jesus Christ, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings. And that word there is used as epikonosko, and it means that I may be able to know Him experientially, not just by knowledge of who God is, but I can experience Him. I know Him in a deep way. I'm going to tell you something. When I got married, I thought I knew my wife. But over the years, I've learned more about my wife, and I love her more. But when it comes to Jesus, the more you know about Him, it's amazing. Our faith is Jesus. And, may, and Paul is saying, my prayer for you is that you may know Him in such an experiential way. We must know God. We must know His Word. We must know His will, and we must experience God in our life. And that's what Paul is praying for them. And my prayer for you is that you will know the fullness of Jesus in your life. The third thing that he says is, I'm praying for you to have discernment. That's another word for wisdom. Proverbs talks about wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? What is discernment? It is being able to look at life from God's perspective. It's being able to see the situation and relate it back to the Bible and relate it back to God and said, okay, God, what are you trying to do? So often what happens to us in our Christian life, we're worried about the guy over in North Korea or we're worried about what's happening in India and over the Middle East and everything else. Listen, it really doesn't matter. What really matters is what God is doing today. Wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective. There's a story about John and Charles Wesley. They were going back to England after a very unsuccessful evangelistic tour in the United States. There were some Puritans on board. And by the way, John and Charles Wesley, there was a storm that was, had come up and, and the boat was rocking back and forth, back and forth. And they thought they'd be, and they were holding on to the mask in the middle of the boat and they were crying out, the Lord, save us, save us. But he noticed that the Puritans weren't. He noticed they were praying and they were singing and they were not worried. And John looked at that, John Wesley, and he said, they had something I didn't have. That was peace and that was joy because they knew that God was in control. Changed his life. Changed his life. He went back to England. He began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just hundreds, but thousands come to Christ because of John and Charles Wesley. But he had to learn 
he had to learn the wisdom of God, that God's in control. Do you look at life from God's perspective? Another thing that you need to look at is excellence. You know, the one thing, we need to learn to do things in an excellent way. Sometimes we get sloppy with our Christianity, don't we? We really do. Oh, well, that's okay. We're saved by grace and everything. No, 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 no. You know, God was pretty concerned with the Old Testament people that the way they did things, wasn't he? For example, I know some churches, when they do communion, they'll, sometimes they'll use leavened bread and, and sometimes they'll use water. Now, you may say, what, well, why are you upset about that? Because the Bible tells us what it's like. It's unleavened bread. It's the fruit of the vine that represents who Jesus is. Don't get sloppy in your worship with Christ. Sometimes we, we worship God when we come here and we sing the song. Oh, that was a good song. Yeah, it really kind of moved me. You know, and the problem is when we worship God, if you feel like raising your hands, by the way, raise your hands. If you don't feel like raising your hands, then don't. That's okay. But keep your worship of God in excellent way. And when you're walking with Jesus outside the church building, walk in an excellent way that people will know that you follow him. I think we as Christians in America have become too sloppy. You may not agree with me, but I do. I agree with myself. <laughs> so anyway. The next thing is sincere. What does that mean? Be sincere in your faith. What it means is be pure. Do you realize that word is taken from a Greek word where it was talking about people who made pots and they'd get the mud there and they'd make this beautiful pot and then they'd put it in the kiln. And then what they would do is they would take it out and it would, as soon as it uh, became cool, then they would pick up the pot and they would look. And as they're looking at it and there was a crack in it, what they would do is they would take wax and they would put on that crack. And that was called an insincere pot. Whereas in reality, it says the pot should be whole, should be a sincere pot. So in essence, the real truth is, is that don't be a crack pot for Jesus, but be a real pot. So anyway, that's, that's it all. And that is a terrible joke, and I understand that. But anyway, what it is saying is you need to be sincere in your faith. You need to be pure in your faith. And that's what that really is talking about. The next thing he says, be, be blameless. I talked to a friend of mine just a few weeks ago. His name is Dave Phillips. He was the superintendent for the Christian Missionary Alliance for several years in northern New England. He lives in Georgia now, and he and I were talking. We were at a meeting together, and uh, we were talking about the condition of the church in America today. He said, did you realize that when I was the director in the Northeast, that 16 members I had to deal with over the years that were in morality, 16 ministers were in morality having affairs. Wow. You know, you know, the old song is, you know, it says, I was sinking deep in sin. You know, the best way to say what some Christians, they look at it this way, you know, I was sinking deep in sin. Wee! That's what's happened to Christians today. I'm going to tell you something. God's holy. He expects us to be holy. Yes, we're saved by grace, but he saved us out of sin. Why in the world would we want to go back to it? It doesn't make sense, does it? And by the way, have you ever noticed that Christians are afraid to call it sin anymore? You don't hear it from the pulpit anymore. Oh, well, you've made a few mistakes in life. Well, those mistakes crucified our Lord. We need to be blameless. When people look at us, do they know that we're Christians? And then it says we need to be fruitful. What does that mean? And we need to bear fruit. That's the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. The Bible also talks about another fruit, seeing people saved. We need to see people saved. If people aren't coming to Christ because of our testimony, we need to ask something, what's wrong? Because Jesus says, look unto the fields, they are white unto harvest. We are living in the church age. We are to see people to come to Christ. If we don't see people coming to Christ, it means we're not sharing the gospel. And by the way, you don't do it just by your life. You also interpret your life why you're a Christian. Both go hand in hand. 
You need to not only share the way you live, but you need to interpret why you live that way. So try, don't try to hide behind, well, I'm, I'm just going to live the good life. Well, think about this. If Jesus just lived the good life, and he did all those miracles, did all those things, and he never told you that he was the Messiah, what would have happened to us? When he went to the cross and died and rose again, we wouldn't know anything about it, would we? But he told his disciples and he told all of his followers why he was doing it. Why are you living the good life? Because Jesus saves us, and he can save you. Fruitful, we need to be fruitful in witness, and we need to be fruitful in holiness. Every good work, we need to be fruitful. God has given you His Holy Spirit to work in and through you. And God is working, chipping away at us day by day, day by day. And there are going to be a lot of, pardon the interruptions, there are going to be a lot of things that are hard. I'd like to close with this illustration. The great Italian sculptor, Benvenuti Cellini, he bought a block of marble, a very big block of marble, and he set it out in front of a church or in front of a building. And he challenged all the sculptures, he's got, uh, all the guys that were into the arts, make something out of this. But the problem with this block, it had a flaw in it, it had a crack in it. Finally, one artist said he would do it. They built some scaffolding around it. He would not let anybody in. And for two years, you could hear chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And after two years, they took down the curtain, and Michael, An Michelangelo's David was there, one of the most beautiful sculptures of all time. You and I come to Christ, we have a lot of flaws. We have a lot of cracks. But in the process of our Christian life, God is chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. We go through interruptions from time to time, but he's chipping away, chipping away. And that grand day when we get to be, go to heaven, the curtain's going to be brought back. And you're going to look in the mirror and say, is that really me? For we are God's work of art. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know where you are spiritually. There's some of you are here that probably don't even know who Jesus Christ is. There's some of you, you've heard a lot about him. The Bible says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says that you need to believe that Jesus died for your sin and rose again and you will be saved. The Bible also says too many of us received him. If you've never received Jesus Christ, I'm encouraging you right now so that you can enter the the work where God begins to work in you, a great work. You can't work for salvation. You don't earn it. Right now, just pray and say, Dear Lord, I recognize that Jesus died for all of my sin, past, present, and future. And I now invite Jesus Christ, His Spirit, to come into my heart and live for eternity. You pray that prayer automatically. God's Spirit comes to live in you, and you have eternal life. He doesn't take it away. He, you begin a new journey with Him. And I pray that some of you, if you do not know Jesus, will do it. At the same time, I'm asking those who are Christians who need to look in the mirror and have their life. And, and for some reason, they're angry at different people. And your life has become humdrum. You're bitter against people. Bitter against God. Bitter against all certain circumstances. You're not thankful. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, we've already been forgiven our sins, but the thing is our relationship with him is not right. So we go to him and say, Lord, may my relationship with you be right and forgive me the way I've been thinking. I know you, you've died on the cross for all my sins, but forgive me if my thinking process is wrong. May I put Jesus back on the throne of my life. Father God, I pray for everybody here this morning. I pray that your spirit will move upon us and that we will become the kind of people you want us to be. I pray for those who pray to receive Christ will begin to grow in Christ and I pray for every believer here that knows you that they will become the people of God that you've called them to be. And the same for me too. For this I pray in Jesus' name, amen.